Well, ladies and gentlemen, here we are again, having a music history moment. It's awfully dark in here next to the fire, but we'll make do. If you remember that the box now were married and got their inheritance and we're all set. And they were living in Mühlhausen. So here we go. It's now 1721. Things didn't work out very well in Mühlhausen. The church authorities were a sour-faced old bunch who didn't believe in having any fun. Within a year, Bach had accepted a job as the court organist to Wilhelm, Wilhelm Ernst, his ducal and serene highness of Saxe Weimar. The duke offered Bach double his previous salary, and Bach said, where do I begin? So remember all this? Are, you, are we with, you know, together? That's just kind of a glance over. So now he got those jobs and all that. So this is where we actually picked up and left off. Now that we remember that he was having that situation, extra money, you know, he's playing the organ. So anyway, all the years of practice, not to mention the walking tours, had made Bach into a terrific organist. Once while playing a concert at the Royal Court of Cassel, he played an elaborate pedal solo as well, so well that the crown prince took a ring off his finger and presented it to Bach. As one observer put it, if the skill of his feet alone earned him such a gift, what might the prince have given him had he used his hands as well? But through it all, Bach remained the same humble man he'd always been. When someone complimented him on his playing, he once said, there's nothing to it. You only have to hit the right notes at the right time, and the instrument plays itself. Easy for him to say. Along about that time, Bach became, fr became friends with Johann Gottfried Walther, an organist and lexiographer. He also won a public clavier playing contest against the French uh, keyboard player Louis Marchand, who failed to show up. Easy way to win. On the day of the contest, Marchand suddenly remembered he had important business out of town. You know how it is. Mom's calling. Bach spent nearly 10 years at Weimar, but then found it was time to move on. The old duke was having a family quarrel with his nephew, and Bach was sort of caught in the middle. So he accepted a job at the court of Prince Leopold of anhalt koten Bach didn't have to leave on the best of terms. He spent nearly a month in jail for too obstinately requesting his dismissal. While he was under arrest, he composed 46 chorale preludes, so the time wasn't completely wasted. He got arrested because he wanted to leave. At Kooten, Bach had a 17-piece orchestra, which kept him busily composing. The court bookbinders finally had to ask him to slow down so they could catch up. He composed little instruction books for his son, Wilhelm Friedmann. The boy, we are told, was very bright, just like his dad. Historians know this because he used to doodle a lot on his old school books. Maybe he was just bored. If you wanted to, you could think of Bach's children by Maria Barbara as his second cousins once removed, but that's probably not a good idea. Bach tried out as organist job for at the Jakobkirche in Hamburg, and although he dazzled the judges with his playing, they wouldn't give him the job unless he made a hefty donation to the church. Bach refused, and the job went to a second-rate organist named Johann Joachim Heitmann, who had just happened to have a spare 4,000 marks in his pockets. Later, Bach composed a set of six concertos that he sent as a gift to Christian Ludwig. The Margrave of Brandenburg, Bach copied out of the score very neatly, tied it up with a nice ribbon, and sent it off to him. The Margrave... Uh, yeah, the Margrave thanked him very much, but probably never opened the package. He didn't have an orchestra, so it didn't do him much good to have the music. Well, it's the thought that counts, however. After Maria Barbara died, Bach married again, this time to Anna Magdalena Wulken, who at 20 was 16 years younger than he was. She was a very good singer and a very good copyist besides. After a while of copying Bach manuscripts, her handwriting began to look like his. Maybe she wrote some of the music. Who knows? Bach's patron, Prince Leopold, got married at about this time too, but he didn't do as well. His new wife was his cousin, the Princess of anhalt bernberg and she thought music was a waste of time. She liked to do needlework, but that's not the same somehow. So, in 1723, Bach and his new wife packed up all their possessions and the kids, there were seven by this time, four boys and three girls, and moved to Leipzig, where Bach was appointed cantor and music director of the Thomas School. 
Bach's possessions included six claviers, a lute, and several other instruments, a variety of candlesticks, two silver coffee pots, one large, one small, a silver teapot, and assorted pieces of furniture. He also had three different coats. The silk one was somewhat worn, he says, the 11 linen shirts at the wash. He probably picked them up before he left town. At the St. Thomas School, Bach was expected to teach the boys music, Latin, and grammar while leaving a sober and secluded life. He was hired, oh, he hired a man named Petzold to teach his Latin classes. For Petzold, what a cool name. Bach was busy at Leipzig. When not disciplining small boys, he found the time to compose nearly 300 cantatas, the B minor mass, his mighty St. Matthew's Passion, we can argue about the St. John's Passion too, if you'd like. In his spare moments, he composed other things. His old temper hadn't left him. When the university officials turned down Bach's application to compose a special piece of music and gave them the job instead to a man named Gunner, Bach tossed his wig at him and said he would have made a better cobbler. Bach's salary at the school was $700 a year, the extra money to lead the choir for funerals. Oh, with extra money to lead the choir for funerals. The school's old rector died and was replaced by Johann August Ernesti. He was one of those progressive types who didn't care for music much. He used to call the boys in the school orchestra pothouse fiddlers, which was bad for morale. Bach spent more and more time traveling around the countryside trying out new organs as an excuse to get away. In his last years, Bach was nearly blind and his health was declining. It was all he could do to jot down the first 239 bars of the last fugue of the Art of Fugue, the most amazingly complicated fugal composition ever written. An English occultist, John Taylor, attempted surgery on Bach's eyes, but did it no good. The, oper the operation left him completely blind. Suddenly, on July 18, 1750, Bach's eyesight was miraculously restored, but he suffered a stroke and died 10 days later. Anna Magdalena never remarried and tried to struggle along on a measly pension. She died a bag lady in the streets of Leipzig. Wilhelm Friedman did pretty well as a composer and recitalist. One source tells us that he had beautifully shaped long fingered hands. Carf Carl Philip Emanuel worked for Frederick the Great, King of Prussia. Frederick liked to play flute but took liberties with the tempo. CPE just played along and then said nothing. After all, Frederick was the king. Johann Christian moved to London and wrote operas. There were other Bachs, but none of them amounted to much. Bach's grandson, Johann Sebastian II, was a painter, but you can't get ahead that way. By May of 1871, historian Sanford Terry says Bach's old blood had ceased to flow in moral veins. That was the end of the Bach line directly. Next week, we learn about George Friedrich Handel, one of the great English composers and a, ma a major composer of the Baroque era. Have a lovely, lovely weekend. We will see you next week.